been a friend of mine for many years. And he has uh, done an amazing amount of research. He has retired from Fort Detrick as one of the leading arbovirologist experts in the world. And uh, he's known everywhere for his work. Uh, he's very modest. He, will, he won't admit anything that I'm saying, but it's all true, believe me. Anybody that knows him would agree. So for my students, I just want you to know that uh, you are in for a treat because uh, Dr. Mike is a very uh, important individual in this field and has done an incredible amount of work on mosquitoes and arboviruses. So um, we're honored to have him with us here tonight. And um, in addition to all this research and things that he does, he also has been leading a Boy Scout troop and a 4-H group for over 30 years. Um, I don't know where he gets that kind of energy to do that kind of stuff. And I'm not kidding, leading the troop in, in unbelievable ways. So I'm gonna let him take it from here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Fred. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. I'll get the screen so you can see my headshots in there. A uh, couple of things. I'm going to try and give a semi-interesting talk about a field study that we did, hard to believe, 20 years ago. When I give a presentation, the first thing I'm going to say is, if you have a question, please speak up immediately. If you're in the audience, raise your hand. If you're on the Zoom call, I can't see your hands. Therefore, interrupt me, say, I have a question. If you have a question, you're not going to listen to me you're gonna think of your question. I want you listening to me. So if you have a question, ask it. That being said, I'm gonna be talking today about the studies we did in Peru, but I'm not sure of the background everybody has in vector-borne diseases. So, yeah, this is really slow. Okay. Okay, we're having a separate speaker. So if you walk over there, the question I have is, we'll just have a double, both, is the sound okay? Because I have two separate speakers on now. Say, someone say yes or no. Yes, it's, it's fine. okay. Everybody just needs to mute their self because somebody like keeps on, you can hear the other person because they're, um, they not muted. Okay, everybody okay. should be mute. If you have a question, unmute and immediately just say, I have a question. Okay. Vector-borne diseases such as malaria, dengue, yellow fever, bubonic plague, Lyme disease, acrosychiasis, all of these are important diseases in the world and cause a major amount of disease. WHO records about 200 million cases of disease every single year. That's human disease. There are about 700,000 deaths from vector transmitted disease, basically mosquito transmitted diseases every single year. These are a real, real problem. Well, I work with arthropod-borne viruses or arboviruses. These are viruses that are maintained in a cycle that involves biting insects. It could be a tick, sand fly, or mosquito, uh, and vertebrate hosts. The virus can has to replicate both in the arthropod vector and in the vertebrate host. Many have a sylvatic cycle, i.e. West Nile virus grows in birds and it grows in mosquitoes. So if it's in birds, it's enzootic or epizootic, there's an outbreak. And others are more urban, such as dengue, chikungunya, or Zika. There's a great diversity of these pathogens in the tropics. An unbelievable number of different viruses in the tropics. Uh, Many of these cause a lot of morbidity and mortality. They kill a lot of people. So these are an important source of human, uh, human lack of health. The five types of disease they cause are fevers, such as dengue fever, sandfly fever, West Nile fever. Most of these viruses will cause a fever in the mild cases. Some of them then cause encephalitis, i.e. a brain infection. These are often very serious and often fatal. And some of them cause hemorrhage, i.e. Bleed, internal bleeding, yellow fever, 
uh, is a hemorrhagic virus. Rift Valley fever causes hemorrhage. Congo Crimean hemorrhagic fever. If you have hemorrhage from any of these, survival is not likely. Hemorrhagic diseases kill. All of these, uh -huh, I can walk over here and point, uh, but then you can't see me. It does me no good to point on the screen. So there's the mouse on here. Okay, all of these are controlled by mosquito factors, vertebrate host factors, virus factors, and all of these interact with the environment. So the environment affects all of these things. And after my you know, four minute introduction, I'm now gonna talk about a field study, a five year field study that we conducted in the Amazon jungle region of Peru. To start this all out, in 1994, a Peru, just back a little bit, Peru and Ecuador have been fighting an active gun shooting war for over a hundred years, over 150 years. Smaller keep talking. Okay. Fred, Fred is uh, adjusting this somehow. Ah. Now I can't see me, but it's okay. I assume everybody can, can everybody see, I assume everybody can still see me, so I'm not going to worry about it. Right. But there's been an active shooting war going on since the 1860s. Uh, Peru, you, uh, Ecuador used to be a narrow country going east west. Peru took over. Eastern half of the country. They've been fighting about that war for 150 some odd years. Uh, a Peruvian soldier on the new border became sick and died of, quote, cerebral malaria. This is an area where there's no electricity, there's nothing there, there are no roads. So there were no biological samples. Well, there was one, they had a finger stick. So they looked at it for malaria and it was negative. So if he doesn't have malaria, he doesn't have cerebral malaria. Therefore, no one knows how he died, but he's dead, we're done. Uh, a month later, two more Peruvian soldiers in the same unit came down with the same illness. This time the Peruvian army said, uh-oh, we gotta find out what's killing these soldiers because this is bad. Both of those soldiers survived but they managed to send a team out there and get a blood sample from each of them. They brought them to the laboratory in Lima. They isolated a virus from the blood. They started to identify the virus and they found out it was Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus. By the way, that's a select agent. This is a biological warfare agent. This is a really bad virus, highly transmissible inside of laboratories. Uh, Doug Watts was the scientific director at the time and he said, you know, Put it in the freezer. Now, close it up. We don't work with that virus in our lab because we're not a high enough security laboratory to work with that virus. So they then took the samples, sent them to us at USAMRD, and we confirmed that it was indeed Venezuelan equine cephalitis. Uh, one of my coworkers was trying to develop a new diagnostic assay for mosquitoes in with Venezuelan equine cephalitis virus in mosquitoes. He was looking for a field site to study Venezuelan in mosquitoes. And we said, wow, this is perfect. So we went down to Peru and set up a field study. It was a collaborative study between us, uh, laboratory at USAMRD, the Naval Medical Research Center, Detachment Lima, NAMRD, the Walter Reed Biosystematics Unit, which is actually part of the Smithsonian. So this was, we had people there from the Smithsonian to identify the mosquitoes, the Peruvian Ministry of Health, the Peruvian Army, and anybody else who wanted to join us. It was kind of fun. For those of who don't know where Peru is, extreme Western part of South America, uh, this thing right here, that's, that's Ecuador. And that used to be Ecuador. So this is now Peru. We're up in the northeastern corner of Peru, the area that used to be Ecuador. And you remember, there was a shooting war going on still. Uh, and there was all kinds of stuff about the Ecuadorian coming across the border, shooting, shooting across planes, come, craziness was going on all the time, but so be it. We were there and we were gonna study this virus in the area. We had several goals. 
the first goal was which species of mosquitoes were found in this area. The Navy laboratory had done mosquito collections and had identified 29 different species of mosquitoes in the area around Iquitos, 29 different species. So we want to know one, well, which species can we find? Second, when are these mosquitoes active? Is there a seasonal difference? Is there a time of day difference? Do they go inside houses, outside houses? What's the behavior of these mosquitoes? Third, and my interest is, well, what viruses are in these mosquitoes? There's a whole bunch of viruses we don't know about. And if trying to find out about them and develop the diagnostic assays for them may be really important 10 years in the future. And finally, which mosquitoes were able to transmit which of these viruses that we found? We found a virus down there, we found a mosquito down there, which mosquito transmitted which virus? So we know which mosquito to control, so we control the right mosquito and stop the disease instead of controlling the wrong mosquito and increasing the disease. Well, we did most of our study in the area around Puerto Amendra. We set up a bunch of CDC light traps. We set them up about one meter above the ground. Uh, we use dry ice as a CO2 source as an attractant. I put the dry ice in one of my old socks. So I got some foot odor and some dry ice because extra attractant is extra attractant. We wanted as many mosquitoes as we could get. Uh, we also set, whoops, wrong way. We also set traps up in the canopy. So we had traps about 10 meters up in the sky. Now I'll point out in the first trial set before we started the study, everything was done on the ground. Roberto Fernandez, who was the professional taxonomist, proving taxonomist, mosquito expert in the area, his love of his life is sand flies. His work is mosquitoes, but he loves sand flies. So after every trap was done, all of the garbage in the bottom of the trap, he looked for the sand flies. And I said, you know, mosquitoes, some are on the ground, some are in the canopy. We should set some traps up in the canopy. He said, that's a waste of time. <laughs> there's get a lot of mosquitoes on the ground. I said, yeah, but there's maybe different ones up in the canopy. And he was, well, that's, that's sort of a waste. We should you know, not waste our time doing that. Where is it in the picture there? Okay. It is right there. Way up at the top. Okay. Yeah, because this thing on here is cutting it off. Mm -hmm. Why? Oh, I, I, yeah. There's a way to look for it. But it's, it's, it's not important to want to make the whole screen go. That's the next one. All right. We'll just leave it. Okay, so I convinced him to try, you know, after we left, set up a trap and see what happens. He set up a trap up in the canopy. In his first night in the one trap, he caught three new species, previously unidentified species of sandflies. He got to name three new species of sandflies in one night. I became an instant best friend. And one of the species is Lutzomaya torellii. He named it after me because it would never have been discovered if he hadn't set a trap up in the... Some mosquitoes live here, some mosquitoes live there, and they don't go back and forth. So we set a bunch of mosquito traps ground level up in the canopy. We also had human collectors because we had two different questions. One, which mosquitoes are there and which mosquitoes bit people? Personally, I don't care which mosquitoes are out there. Well, I sort of do, but I really need to know which mosquitoes are biting people because those are the ones that can transmit disease. And I should point out that before we had any of the local collectors collect mosquitoes, I spent a whole bunch of nights sitting there with my pant legs rolled up catching mosquitoes. I've done that in Peru, Ecuador, Costa Rica, Senegal, Kenya, Thailand. I've gone all over the world letting mosquitoes bite me. I have no common sense at all. So we had human collectors sitting on, the, well, sitting on the ground and all these collectors were usually about two meters, six feet away from a light trap. And we also had, and again, we're missing the very top. We had a platform and a layer, uh, of which the collectors would climb up this platform, sit on, climb, climb up the stairs, sit on the platform and catch mosquitoes. Our collectors collected from the hour to 40 minutes after the hour. So they collect for 40 minutes 
rested for 20, collected for 40 minutes, rested for 20 on a 12 hour shift. Uh, they got paid some ridiculous amount of money. I think it might've been $5 for a 12 hour shift, <laughs> which makes you, which sounds ridiculous. Only friends of the people of the staff got to work because whether you were working a 12 hour construction job of hard physical work or sitting there catching mosquitoes, and you can get bit by mosquitoes either way. There was a, we had a line of people. They're like, if you're late one time, you're fired. If you don't, if we catch you one time, not doing your job, you're fired. We have a line of people wanting this job. So we collected a bunch of mosquitoes on the ground, up in the canopy, inside the houses. By the way, that's his bed right next to him. That's his bed. So here he's actually getting less bites by catching mosquitoes rather than by sleeping. And we collected mosquitoes outside the houses. So we could, and we also had the light trapped inside and outside houses. So we're trying to find out where mosquitoes were, where they're biting, and what and what how the difference between a light trap, which is the standard trap, and mosquito and human 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 landing collections. We then brought the traps in and these little containers down here at the bottom, which are full of mosquitoes. Those are mosquitoes that the people caught trying to attack their legs. We were often getting 50 mosquitoes at a, you know, in one of those little containers. It was crazy. There were a lot of mosquitoes there. Uh, I remember one of my first nights walking out, carrying two light traps, one in each hand. As I was walking out, there was this screen in front of me and this cute little toy was sitting right there. I do not like spiders. I have, well, I'm an, I'm an arachnophobe. And there was this spider, which is a good four or five inch leg span at face level. I put the traps down, took my phone out, handed the phone to the person behind me, walked around the netting and put my hand up there and smiled. Got some pictures, took a stick and went, because we had to walk the trail. There's also a whole bunch of shrubbery there. Those little spiny things are about six inches long and uh, they're hard wood. They don't break. Yeah. Well, they go in your body, they break off in your body. Exactly. <laughs> these, these are evil, evil things. Uh, this, these are spider webs. You, can't, you have no idea what this is really like unless you've got a close up. There are thousands upon thousands of spiders. I mean, that's a close up of that thing. Here, this is all tens of thousands of spiders on that web. I don't like spiders. So this was not fun. Well, what did we find? Well, the first question I wanted to ask was, how does a CDC trap do? If it catches mosquitoes, what, how can we use that data? So if you go in the village, and we did this for 84 24 hour periods, if we averaged over the 20, 84 24 hour periods, 200 Culex mosquitoes in a CDC trap, and two Anopheles darling eye in the trap. What mosquitoes the problem in the area? You would think it's 100 to one on the Culex, man, that's gotta be a problem. You got 200 per night, 200 per day in, of the Culex mosquitoes alone. That's, that's scary. Well, here's the actual data. Uh, in the CO2 trap, we actually caught 1.9 for 24 hour period. We caught 16 of the Culex melaniconian, so it's Culex Culex, and 184 of the Culex melaniconian. So we caught a little bit over 200 Culex per 24 hour period on CDC trap. Two anopheles. But if you look at what, the, what was biting the people, the human collectors, we caught 55.2. We only caught 28, well, 29 Culex. We caught twice as many Culex, twice as many Anopheles as Culex, but we caught 10 times as many in the CDC trap. It's completely reversed. You need to know what's biting people. That was the first thing we found, that you need to know what's there. Uh, 
I should point well, to where are they biting? Are they indoors or outdoors? Now, we had collectors indoors, outdoors. If you look at the Anopheles, this is the vector of malaria in the area, Anopheles darlinii. 50% with a person inside and 50% with a person outside. They could care less whether you're inside or outside. Uh, the Culex species were mostly outside, only 35% inside. The Mansonia liked to go in the houses. Uh, the Culex Culex really did, only 28%. We had a couple of unusual species. The only ones we caught were inside the house, very small numbers. This was a mosquito species that's a jungle species. These, ho these houses are huts built up against the jungle. So inside the house is still inside the jungle. Outside the house, uh, they're not there. If I'm collecting mosquitoes out in the forest, the mosquitoes are attacking me. If I walk out of the forest onto the dirt road, the mosquitoes stopped at the forest line and didn't attack me, they just left. They stay at home in the forest. Of course, once I'm out in the out in that road for two minutes, the open area mosquitoes find me and start attacking, but they're completely different mosquitoes. So where you are makes a real difference as to which mosquitoes will find you. Well, when are they biting? Everybody knows mosquitoes bite at night, right? Mosquitoes bite at night. Now, this is the curve starting from 06, 0600 hours, that's dawn. We're about two degrees south of the equator. The equator goes through this area. So dawn, year round, dawn is at 6 a.m. Sunset is at 6 p.m. There is no daylight savings time. This is just constant. So it was really good for doing this. So at dawn, we had about 50 mosquitoes per hour. Big bump up about noon, great big bump at sunset, and then another bump back at dawn. So they were active 24, I don't care what time of day you're there, you're getting eaten alive. But it's species specific. If you look at the Seraph or Ferox, they're there all day long, but they're virtually none of them. Once it's dark, they're, they're, high, they're going to sleep for the night. They do not attack during the night at all. But if you look at the uh, Pedro eye, we never caught one the entire time during the day. They slept all day long, but they were biting all night long. If you look at 80s fulvus, it's a great big yellow 80s. Really, you could see them 10 feet off coming towards you. They're really cool. But they're active 24 hours a day. Not that active during the day, really active at sunset. Why is it doing that? Uh, let that go away. Okay, weird. Yeah. Okay, we're back. Okay, that's that slides now. That slides banned for right now. We're going to ignore it. But the Theraphora albiginu, which you can sort of see in this slide now, peaked right at noon. Huge peak right at noon. Well, conclusions I don't care what time of day you were there. They bit you 24 hours a day. They were constantly biting. Biting activity, though, was very, very species specific. Some bit only during the day, some bit only at night. Some species, yeah, they bit during the day and night, but virtually all of the bites were right. species using different traps. Uh, so you got to be careful with what you report. Uh, okay. Again, my sort of goal on this study was, well, what viruses can we find in these mosquitoes? We know for each of these, so hold on, this slide here. Okay. Yeah. 
I'll go back and forth for a second. This is Roberto. His job was to identify the mosquitoes. So Roberto, Francisco, a, a couple of other people would, Faustino would identify the mosquitoes, put them into little plastic petri dishes on ice. We had a plastic tray, put some water in it, stuck in the freezer, instant ice tray. Much cheaper than buying one of those electronic ones. This one was our portable ice tray. So it keep them on ice so we could do virus isolations from them. And he would put whatever species in whichever petri dish it was from that trap. We often got a thousand mosquitoes in a CDC trap. Once we had a bunch of mosquitoes in one of those petri dishes, I would dump it out, count out 25, put it in one of these little vials, keep it on ice, and then we put it back in the freezer. So we would keep these things frozen, actually put them on dry ice. So we get them really frozen. <clears throat> and we can identify pools of one of 25 or 50, depending on the, on the species size. Back here. So we pulled them by species of 25 or 50 per pool. Uh, I then brought these back to you, Samrid. You would not believe the paperwork you need to have to bring dead mosquitoes into the United States. But we did it. Uh, we brought, I ground them up in two mLs of diluent. Then we assayed them for live virus on viral cells. Some, some viruses grow really fast. You would stay in those for two days. Some grow really slowly. You stay in them at six days. We did everything in duplicate, stained them both times. And we then identified any viruses we found by PCR, by fluorescent antibody testing, nucleus, all different methods to identify the virus. This is uh, these little tricycle cars, these were a blast to ride all over the place because they, they ignore all traffic laws. Uh, this is a this is a part of the town when the Amazon is in the dry season, this is a regular ordinary road. In the wet season, the water, it's four, the road is four feet underwater. Their houses are four feet underwater. That happens for several months every single year. They have their fields that are out in the middle of the Amazon. But when dry season hits, they go out there and plant corn. And everything is everything works great. Is this a Quito? This is a Quito's. Our, we, are, we had a field laboratory in a Quito's. Okay, it's a plaque assay. So these are just cell, these are just cells. I put my solution of the stuff on there. And if there's a virus particle, it sticks to the cell. You then put in an agarose level so any virus comes out of the cell <laughs> can't go anywhere because it's stuck in under jello and it affects the cell next to it affects the cell next to it you come back so many days later you put a stain which is absorbed by living cells so living cells get this nice pink color but if you have only dead cells it's clear and this is lots and lots of virus one to 10 dilution of that, one to 10 dilution of that, a one to 10 dilution of that, a one to 10 dilution of that, and a one to 10 dilution. So that one has two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. About are these six. Are viral cells in these? These, these are viral cells here. Yeah. They know. I taught them black essay. Remember black essay, right? <laughs> dilution, right? See how? Yeah. This is a so it's serial dilution. I can tell you what the title of that virus was. So, we tested over 500,000 mosquitoes in this study and another three to 400,000 mosquitoes in a separate study we did right after this. And out of these first 500,000 mosquitoes, we made more than 160 virus isolations. There were a lot of viruses there, but that's one in every 3,000, a little bit less than one in 3,000 mosquitoes tested to get one stupid virus. It's a mm -hmm. lot of work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some of the viruses we found, toga virity, Eastern equine encephalitis virus. Again, this is, at the time we did this, Eastern equine was a select agent. Uh, all kinds of crazy rules, but with, this is a horrible, miserable virus. Someone then decided a few years later that the South American Eastern viruses and the North American Eastern viruses are closely related, but different viruses. So the viruses in North America are a select agent, all the stupid rules of maintaining it, but the South American ones are just a virus, don't worry about it. So we got that changed to, we changed the name of the virus 
add from Eastern to something else. So it's not a select agent, but it's Eastern. Una, uh, Venezuelan equine cephalitis. We're not getting onesies of, of the bad viruses. We're not getting onesies and twosies. We've got 40 different isolations of Eastern, 25 of Venezuelan. Uh, that's scary. That's a, that, these viruses were common in the area. Uh, Flavy viruses, St. Louis, we've got a couple, just a couple, St. Louis, Aeas, and two more that we still haven't identified. And then Bunya viruses, a uh, whole bunch of unidentified. Now, since I made up this slide, I gave some specimens to another group, and they identified a virus out of it. And it was a virus never previously seen, so it was a brand new virus. My guess is most of those not identified are new viruses. It's just, you take, it takes a laboratory with the appropriate methods of identifying unknown viruses. It's sort of like giving an unknown species a mosquito. Are you sure it's an unknown species? Because you're not, are you really that much of an expert in that subgroup of that subgenus? So what about the flavid virus? Were there yellow fevers in there? Uh, we did not find any yellow fever or any dengue. That's surprising. There's a lot of dengue in the area. There's another study that we did where I tested the other 300,000 mosquitoes. Completely side issue. Yellow fever is a monkey virus. It goes monkey, mosquito, monkey, mosquito, hemagogus, and Aedes africanus. In Africa, it's Aedes africanus. In South America, it's Sabbathine species and hemagogus. Jungle cycle. And every once in a while, uh, this, these mosquitoes live in the treetops with the monkeys up there, and people rarely get bit. But some stupid forester goes out there and cuts down a tree because he's trying to sell wood. When the tree falls down, the mosquitoes, and mosquitoes are not the smartest creatures in the world, the mosquitoes stay in the top of the tree. Of course, the top of the tree is horizontal on the ground. The woodcutter goes in amongst the top of the tree, starts cutting off the branches. The mosquitoes say, oh, cool, food. So they bite them. The person gets yellow fever. So you would get occasional cases of yellow fever in South and Central America from mostly woodcutters who are hacking away at the tops of trees at ground level. Mosquitoes aren't smart enough to realize that that tree horizontal is not a vertical tree, but we're fortunate. Well, then they have these big outbreaks like in Brazil a few years ago. Yeah, well, dengue is there. It's the same mosquito cycle as dengue. I could go into like a 20 minute talk as, as to what's going on with yellow fever, but when we're done, if people want, I'll be glad to talk about what's happened with yellow fever. But our question here is dengue is in parts of the world, they have found a monkey cycle of dengue. So they wanted to do a study of, is there a, is there a cycle of dengue virus in the local monkeys? So they went out, got a bunch of monkeys, built steel cages with just bars, so when, Mosquitoes have free access to the monkeys, two monkeys per cage, and the monkeys are either placed one meter off the ground or 10 meters off the ground. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. They then put a funnel top netting on top of the cage to a trap. So any mosquito that went in to get the monkeys, when they leave, they go upward, they go into the trap because they get sucked up in there. And they collected several hundred thousand mosquitoes feeding on those monkeys, ground level or in a canopy. The question was, they bled these monkeys every month. Did they get infected with dengue? They are located about, oh, 15 kilometers, 10 miles outside of Iquitos, where there's a lot of dengue. So they're in a dengue area. They did this study for a year and a half. They did not get one single isolation of dengue virus. They did not get one single monkey serial convert. It was a complete failure. The Navy lieutenant, now a lieutenant, a Navy captain, a Bulbert colonel type, uh, was very discouraged because when he did, he got, he arranged all this, and then he got peace, he got changed of station during the study. The data was negative. Yeah, not worth doing. Negative data. This is for the students. Negative data is important. If you don't publish it, some idiot will repeat your study. And if they don't publish it, another person will repeat the study. And it gets done over and over again. If you've done it properly, publish the negative data. 
Doug Watts and I were at a meeting in Mexico four years ago, and we said, you know, we should publish that data. So I contacted the naval captain now and said, hey, we've got to publish your paper. He said, go right ahead, include me as an author. So I did. So we did the paper and we found no evidence of local transmission of dengue in those in the jungle itself. That being said, uh, final part of my little talk is on that, which mosquito transmits which virus. If you control the wrong, there is no such thing as mosquito control. All mosquito control is directed at specific species. What control species A may control species B, may have no effect on species B, or may enhance species B. If species B is your vector and you do control against species A, you might get lucky and reduce disease. You may have no effect, or you may significantly, I mean, highly significantly increase the amount of disease and death, as was demonstrated for West Nile virus in the United States. I'll go into that if you want to hear it later. So we had to determine which uh, arthropod or rodent is involved with virus. So the first thing I did is I brought all these viruses back, picked out some I might be interested in, took a bunch of hamsters, shot them up with a virus, bled my hamsters every day, to determine a viremia profile. How much virus does this virus grow in a hamster? Does this virus grow in a baby chicken? What is the best model to use? When we normally did this, we would set our traps out. We'd go out every morning at six o'clock at well, 5.30 in the morning. So we would arrive at the, our field traps just about six, bring a bunch of collectors out with us, drop off the new collectors, pick up the old collectors, drive back and eat breakfast. At 5.30 in the afternoon, we would drive back out bring the nighttime collectors, bring back the daytime collectors. So all the collectors worked six hours or 12 hours. We changed our light traps at dawn and dusk. So we had nighttime light traps, daytime light traps. All of our stuff was really good for time of day. Uh, we wanted to know which of these mosquitoes could transmit what. So we would normally would do, collect those mosquitoes, come in and then spend eight hours sorting mosquitoes every day. It was a lot of work. Well, the last day, the last night, I'd come back with my cartons of mosquitoes, and instead of putting them in the freezer, killing them, identify them, I put them in a plastic bag, removed all the spiders, because spiders are evil, because they kill mosquitoes. You remove the spiders, remove the things that were not mosquitoes, took them out, put the mosquitoes, combine them into lots of mosquitoes in a cage, and put them in my luggage and took them home with me. I had all the permits to bring live mosquitoes back into the US. Brought them back, or to my laboratory. I'd already done the studies with the hamsters, chickens, and viruses, so I know what day for which virus, whether hamster or chicken, how many hours after infection is best time to feed it. So I fed a bunch of mosquitoes on viruptic animals. And basically, uh, you allowed the mosquitoes to feed the infected animal. Those that fed, I would hold them for about a week or two weeks and then test them. The, if they don't feed, I would kill them. And I would talk to the mosquitoes and I would tell them, if you feed on this animal, you will get to have a nice blood meal and have fun. If you don't feed on this animal, I'll put you in the freezer. Your choice. You know, the mosquitoes listened very well. Almost all of them fed. I actually lied a little bit because some of the mosquitoes that didn't feed, I then inoculated the virus. So I knew they were infected. So I could find out whether they could transmit or not. I allowed some of the mosquitoes to refeed. I assayed legs and bodies to see what's happening with them, test everything for virus. Uh, everything was done in compliance with all of the animal use stuff because if you don't, you go to jail. I inoculated mosquitoes. That's feeding. This is actually the transmission part where that is Mosquito number 210, mosquito number 110 is now feeding to see, does this mosquito, which was exposed to virus, is it able to transmit virus to a hamster? So I would then bleed that hamster the next day, was it infected or not? Uh, we then take the mosquitoes, assay the bodies and the legs to see where the virus is in the mosquito, if it's there at all. And basically, because the data is not worth looking, unless you're interested in the actual data, it's not worth looking at. But different mosquito species differ significantly in their ability to become infected. 
So some mosquitoes were good vectors of Venezuelan, but poor vectors of St. Louis or Eastern or, or the bunny virus. Others were good vectors of the bunny viruses, but very poor vectors of Venezuelan or Eastern. So we had all the different mosquitoes, all the different viruses. Some species were barely susceptible to infection of one virus, where the, uh, so I just uh, said, were, were the most efficient vectors for different viruses. So you had to know for, if this is the disease you're worried about, this is the mosquito you control, not that mosquito. And uh, some mosquitoes, although they were easy to infect, the virus infected them very efficiently. For some reason, their salivary glands had like a steel case around it. So you had an infected mosquito, but when they bit, there was no virus in the saliva. It's called a salivary gland barrier. So I was looking for mid-gut barriers. Does it get infected or not? Does the virus get out of the mid-gut and disseminate throughout the body? Sort of like polio virus in a human. Polio in a gut, who cares? The mild, very mild diarrhea infection, no real illness whatsoever. If it gets out of the gut into the body, it become, you become viremic, more serious disease. And if it crosses, crosses the blood-brain barrier, you're in an iron lung. You're in real trouble. This is the equivalent here. It's in the gut, out of the gut, and into the salivary glands. It gets in the salivary glands, it's dangerous. And I had some fun. I met some interesting people. I got to play with live beetles. I like beetles. These are all live, crawling up and down my shirt. I also had these crawl on my arm. I have, I didn't bring any real big ones with me, but when they have huge tar, uh, uh, tarsal claws, if you try and pull them off your arm, you'll have 12 red spots on your arm because each leg has two tarsal, tarsal has two tarsal claws and they would both grab on and hold on for life. And they were like 12 needles going in your arm. I did not learn well. I did that many times. Uh, I mentioned that I, we did <laughs> I did visit the Peruvian soldiers. Right, uh, this is as we were setting up for the entire study. So we joined the Peruvian army, and we actually. I have a little list of stupid things I've done in my life. The number one stupid thing I have done is join the Peruvian army, and go up in Ecuador. <laughs> the I was with a Peruvian scientist and she we were there. They were doing a study in hepatitis virus and a vaccine study in the Peruvian soldiers with a real problem of hepatitis D and hepatitis E. They were giving hepatitis B vaccine to stop this thing. And she had, she was the only one there who was qualified to bleed a human. And she was the only one there who was qualified to do the long questionnaire and she had like, 30 soldiers she had to do both of, and it was taking forever. Now, I am not legally allowed to bleed humans, but I have bled thousands of birds. Which is easier to bleed, a human or a bird? If the human sees it, if the human holds still, they're so much easier. So I said, I can bleed them. So I bled a whole bunch of the soldiers who were very cooperative, no problems. And I had no, I had, I didn't miss a single stick. I did, it went very well. We got everything done. And then the commander said, would you like to go up into Ecuador? Now, this is all, I spoke no Spanish at the time. And the uh, Peruvian scientist said, yeah, you want to do that? I said, is it safe? She asked, oh, she, oh, he said, not a problem. So he sent a squad up ahead. By the way, uh, the Russians armed the Peruvians, we armed the Ecuadorians. So we're on the wrong side of the war. But they all have AK-47s uh, with, with double banana clips. They have a, a clip with like 30 rounds in it and another clip here and a piece of tape on so you can put it in this way, flip it around, put it, you can have 60 shots within a couple of seconds. Really, really interesting stuff. So I'm there with my AK-47 having a good time. Uh, Mine is unloaded, but they let me put a unit. This, this is their uniform. They put on the armored vest and the weapon also. So I had some pictures. We then walked up in Ecuador. Uh, the squad he set up ahead of us is all, it's a, a woods clearing woods. 
we're in one wood line and there are 15 soldiers all on one knee with their weapon like this looking across the clearing all behind a tree of just the head and the weapon pointing to the clearing. The commander, the Peruvian scientist and myself walked out to the center of the clearing where there was a stone. This marked the official border decided in 1862. We took two steps across the border, took some pictures of us and came back. I thought all this stuff was a joke. The, the sergeant lined all the soldiers up and came by and collected all of the double ammo, ammo clips and then had them do inspection arms. I pulled the thing back, a round was injected. All of their weapons were loaded, and I don't think on safety. They, they, the thing is they showed up en masse, and I am sure there were some Ecuadorian soldiers on the other wood line, but they're, you know, they're twosies and threesies, or they're walking, looking for an inclusion. Well, if we shoot, the entire company is there. We're gonna get blasted, better not shoot. Are they really coming? Oh no, they're just being silly. So they let us, they didn't shoot at us. If they had known there was someone there from the US Army in Ecuador and could shoot me and prove that the US Army had sent a person in Ecuador, I would have been a target like you wouldn't believe. That's me. Okay, that's the sorting mosquitoes. Uh, this is a really cool tail of swift scorpion. Uh, those are inches, not centimeters. It has a span of over seven inches across, over seven, eight inches tall. It is a huge creature. I saw it. I literally dove at it, missed, got to my knees and dove again, and got one hand over the legs, so I brought it home with me. Uh, I brought my wife over in 2000. This is a Machu Picchu. Um, Thing on top is really annoying because the music at the top of the screen. But how does that mouse the yeah put the cursor on it? Supposed to be able to yeah. you know, into the black area. Oh, yeah. I can't see the drop down arrow. Click on that. Now ah, okay. That's good enough. You can now see the top of Wyoming. This is Wyoming Pichu. Uh, when we there were there, I brought my wife and our three kids. And uh, my son and my younger daughter and I, for some reason, which I still don't understand, have some really cool pictures of us standing right there. On the very, we climbed to that very spot. What? I turned around and like two feet from me. <laughs> there's there's lots of wildlife here. This is on the Inca Trail, and you can hike to there. But this is this is the. Maybe I'll get rid of this thing now. Yeah, I'll get that back. Give me really well. But this is the this is Machu. Picchu. This, is, this is the really big tourist area, Machu Picchu. This village from 500 years ago. And this is a book, more of the trail going into it, and it then goes out that way and up and over this mountain. That looks like it's impossible to climb. It's sort of like if you were to climb the uh, Washington Monument, it's stairs. Uh, there's, tra there's a trail here going zigzag, zigzag, zigzag all over this whole thing. There are only a few places that were steep, and you're on top. It took us about an hour. To get older. When yes. in 2000 were you there? Uh, November. Hmm. De Decem December, December 2000. We were there in May. Oh, I take it back. No, that, 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 was, Equ that was Ecuador in, in December. Uh, this was, I don't remember what month it was. I, I go find out. See that rock right there, Mike? Which one? Right there to the left of Barbara. So, right there, yeah, it said Fred was there in 96. <laughs> but it was it was a lot of fun. So basically, I think at this point we're going to say, okay, that's basically the end of the, the talk. I have a 
Yeah, that was the, uh, that's that's the end of my formal presentation. Does anybody have any questions? You can get rid of that. Can I close this? Yeah, close it. All right, I'll just open this. Okay. Yeah, um, you said that uh, some of the Right. Yes, okay. The, the question for those people who may not have heard the question is some mosquitoes transmit a virus while others do not. In order to be able to transmit the virus, the virus needs to replicate in that mosquito. Remember, people and cows and mice, cats, and dogs are all mammals. That's why I can say they're all mosquitoes, all different kinds. Different kinds of mosquitoes would be completely different animals. I have a question. In just one second, let me answer this question first. Why certain mosquitoes can transmit that in the mid gut, you have to have a receptor for that virus. Some viruses will infect a person, but not infect a dog. So this will affect the dog, but not affect the person. Some mosquitoes, some viruses will affect an 80s mosquito, but not a QX mosquito. Will affect an 80s Egypti, but not 80s Inurate, or vice versa. So if the receptors are not there, you can't transmit. Yes. There was another question a few seconds ago. I have a question. Go for it. What's the question? Uh how many years have you been collecting samples? How many years have I been collecting insects? Six. 71. Oh, 71. 71. I started collecting insects in 1952. Mm. I was four years old. I moved to the suburbs and was a really big kid. He was nine years old and he got me interested in insects. So I started collecting in 1952. And it's a scary thought. <laughs> 71 years of doing this. I've been working overseas with mosquitoes and viruses for 40 years. But so working viruses and mosquitoes type stuff for about 50 years. Dr. Terrell? Yes, yes, Bill. Um, I know that your uh, collection method was sort of generalized, and it looks seems like you collected uh, quite a variety of uh, of mosquito species. Of those, first of all, how many total species did you guys collect? And of them, how many were serious disease vectors? Before he answers that, all students type your name into the chat box so I can take your attendance. Okay, uh, I forgot to mention that that when we started the study, as I mentioned, there were 29 species of mosquitoes known to exist in this region. We have voucher specimens for 99 different mosquito species in the Smithsonian now from this study. <laughs> we also have a couple of voucher specimens for species which are distinct from all known species, but they, haven't, they weren't described yet. They probably still haven't been described. So we, we caught over 100 different mosquito species. Now, when you talk about disease, are you talking about malaria? Then Anopheles darlinchi is by far the most important mosquito, and there's a lot of malaria in the area. If you're talking of Venezuela equine cephalitis, then it is Culex melanoconian, uh, gracious, we'll blank out the name. Uh, but there's one particular species of Culex, uh, Neomelan um, Culex melanoconian, which is the vector for that one. For Eastern equine, the most important vector was uh, Culex pedroi. So for different species and for different viruses, for the common viruses, remember I'm testing 20, 30 different mosquito species, the common species we had, which ones could transmit. Pedroi had most of the virus isolations and was the most important vector. Uh, why am I drawing a blank on American? No, uh, Culex nomatus. Culex nomatus, Culex melanoconia nomatus was the most important vector for Venezuelan. Actually, that was fascinating because when we started the study, that species did not exist. It was a species, Culex bomerifer. 
and we made three isolations of Venezuelan virus from Culex vomerifer. The next year, some idiot down there decided that one of the spots on the side of the thorax, if it was a pinpoint spot, it was vomerifer. If it was a fuzzy spot, it was nomadus. Uh, so we said, okay, they changed names of the species. So we separated the two species. Well, we made about 30 isolations of Venezuelan virus, sorry, 20 some odd isolations of Venezuelan virus from nomadus and not a single isolation from uh, vomerifer. We caught more vomerifer than nomadus, but did not get another single isolate from vomerifer. In the laboratory, I took a mixture of the two species, fed them on a hamster that infected a virus. Then held them for two weeks, separated them by species, tested them. The nomadus were good vectors. The vomerifer were terrible vectors. Terrible for the virus, I mean, good for us. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but these two species had been one species for years and years. So this crazy person who separated the two species knew what they were doing. They really are two completely different from a vector point of view species. Okay, just for those of you who aren't here, I just brought a few pretty things to look at. These are some of the cute little creatures we caught. That particular tarantula, one of the uh, people sitting on the log doing the landing collections, found this thing crawling up beside him, took his machete out and whacked it. Can you go full screen? Yeah. yeah. What type of beetle is that? That big giant one? Oh, uh, just, just one second. I have several different giant ones in there. But I think the one you point out, I will point to it as soon as Fred fixes this thing. Speaker. We'll go to speaker. Next speaker. The one okay. with the big okay. horn so on its nose is uh, a Hercules beetle. Well, no, this this one over here, uh, the really big one I think she's talking about is a Harlequin beetle. So that's a Harlequin beetle. Uh, no, the one that's down beside that tarantula. I oh. think it's a beetle. <laughs> what over here? Okay, yep. Okay. Turn this around. You mean this one right here? That's a hurricane's deal. Yes, yes. Yep, they were common there. The one to below it down here, that's a harlequin beetle. That's a male harlequin. Those are the female harlequins. One in the middle here is a cerebicid. Hold on one second. What the? If you had actually come to the meeting, you could have seen some of the cool things. So we had a couple of little tiny moths in the center there. Those are pretty, not so scary. <laughs> uh, when, when it's dark out and something's flying at you, it's, you never know what's scary or not. I have, I have a question. question. I have a question. Yes. How do you know which mosquito is dangerous that can make you sick? That's why we did the study, but you don't know that. So what we did is you catch the mosquitoes, you test them to see which of those mosquitoes actually have virus inside the mosquito. And those are ones that are potentially dangerous. And then you allow those mosquitoes in a laboratory to feed on an animal that's infected with virus. To see, can it become infected? And if it could become infected, can it transmit the virus? And in order to be important, it has to be a common mosquito. I don't care how good a vector is, if it's really on the endangered species list, yeah. there's not enough of them out there to do any danger. But if there are, it's a common mosquito, it gets infected in nature, and it can transmit the virus, then it's important. Other questions? Oh. 
Yes. I have a question. Just one, we have one in, we have one from here in the audience. So go ahead. Okay, most dangerous, what the question is, what is the most dangerous species of mosquito? I would guess it's probably Anopheles gambii. It's found in many parts of Africa. It is the most important vector of malaria. That was a statement you could make 20 years ago. Clean, easy statement. Because of the molecular techniques they now have today, they have discovered that Anopheles gambii is not a single species. There are many, many species that all look exactly the same. You give an expert a microscope and a specimen and they cannot tell you what species it is. They do a genetic analysis of it. And this is species Anopheles gambii A, Anopheles gambii B, Anopheles gambii C, et cetera. And they're they claim to be different species. They claim there's enough genetic diversity between them. They are separate species. Some of those scientists have since shown are really, really good vectors of malaria. And for some unbelievable reason, other growth species in that same species, you know, Anopheles C instead of Anopheles, Anopheles gambi C instead of Anopheles gambi A, are really poor vectors. So yes, like our study of Vomera for nomadus, they may be previously identified as one species, but they're really two different species. And one of them is a vector, one is not. They did a really crazy study in Africa where these things, they form mating swarms. They'll find a bush and all of the males and females will congregate on top of that bush. You'll get a cloud of mosquitoes. It's a singles bar. They went there with a butterfly net. They went through this thing, caught a hundred mosquitoes, brought them back and every single one is Anopheles gambii A. Went to another one, through every single one's Anopheles gambii B. And they kept doing this, yes, they were all Anopheles gambii, they had to use uh, molecular means to separate the species, but each of these clusters was only a single species. Then they got smart, they stood back and they pointed, that one way over there, that's Anopheles species A, that one over there. That's a B. From 50 feet away, they can identify it. You couldn't do it with a microscope, but from 50 feet away, they could tell you what species it was. If you look at the bush and you looked under the bush, if it was dirt, it was species A. If it was grass, it was species B. Species A only went to the little bush over dirt. Species B only went to a little bush over green grass. That's how you said, the spe that's how the species knew where to go. So it's rather amazing. There was another question from, from the audience. I had a question. Go for it. My first exposure to arboviruses was in a book by Brooke Worth from the Philadelphia Academy. He was in Trinidad with a Trinidad and Tobago Regional Virus Lab. And he did what you did. He collected at ground level, but also up in the canopy. And he told a story similar to yours where the red howler monkeys had their malaria vectors up in the canopy and when the woods then cut the trees down occasionally there would be a few reports of what they called sylvan malaria yes. and i think he might have been responsible for trinidad doing away with the requirement that we all got malaria prophylactic before we went down there because it wasn't in the general population it wasn't being transmitted in the cities or anything. And is that <clears throat> still a term they use, sylvatic malaria or yellow fever? Sylvatic so yellow fever, definitely, yes. Yeah. Uh, but the problem becomes one of doing away with the malaria prophylaxis. If you're down there to go to the jungle to climb trees, because that's what you want to do down in South America, you definitely need the vaccine, you definitely need the prophylaxis because you're going up in the trees with the monkeys. And sure. you can get bit by the right mosquito. If you're going to be down at ground level, a lot of this, I was taking malaria chemoprophylaxis for a lot of my trips. And one of the trips we were trying to, to test a new diagnostic for malaria in a mosquito. So we went to a village that was, oh, 
about an hour's drive from the nearest source of electricity. We talked to the village elders and got permission to collect mosquitoes to look for malaria in the mosquitoes. The only way we could find catch the mosquitoes was human landing. You know, we saw that 50 to 1 ratio, of, which was the mosquito comes to people, not to light traps. So at dusk, we asked them which huts in the village had the most recent cases of malaria. So we sat down outside those huts, rolled up our pant legs, and caught the Anopheles as they bit us. Hmm. Uh, our risk of getting malaria was relatively high. I was definitely on chemoprophylaxis for that trip. On a lot of others, I was on chemoprophylaxis, and I said, you know, I'm getting bit by these serapha like crazy. They hurt. But I'm not getting any Anopheles bites. Why am I taking chemoprophylaxis? So I just stopped taking it. Hmm. Uh, as far as I know, I never got malaria. Though almost every one of my coworkers who I worked with in Africa and South America all came down with malaria. It's, it's a risk if you're collecting mosquitoes in the jungle and in rural villages, it's a risk. But malaria is treatable. I don't worry about malaria. Some of, the, some of these other viruses, there is no treatment. Those, those you worry about. I've had a few vaccines in my life. Eastern equine, Western equine, Japanese encephalitis, uh, tick-borne encephalitis, uh, Rift Valley fever, chikungunya, and a whole bunch of others. These are all, none of these are licensed vaccines. Well, Japanese encephalitis is licensed. All the others are not licensed. So I've had lots and lots of, I've volunteered for lots of experimental vaccines. I figure better to be vaccinated than not vaccinated. Other questions? I, I did. Yeah, this, this, they saw this one already. So some of the cool beetles. I just realized I didn't bring the big beetles. The big megasomas, I didn't bring any of those. So there's some real, the ones I had crawling on my shirt. Well, you got titanius there, that's true. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, the biggest oh, one there is. Excuse me. Well, yes. Are you saying those are not big beetles? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not. Uh, well, how, question is, how do you define big? If you do like, weight, length, width, you know, the oh, big. Right there, that's the hair you're trying to split. Yes. Yeah. The problem is that there's a, there's a species down there called Megasoma, which are was it was the genus Megastoma, which means big body. And there's several species of it. And uh, they're you, uh, they're, they're like a baseball. Uh, they're, they're, they're big, round, heavy, massive beetles. Now, if you were riding a motorcycle and you were not wearing a helmet, you're doing 50 miles an hour going down a dirt road. And it, by the way, these big beetles fly like giant Japanese beetles, they fly. If it was flying the other direction on that road, hit you between the eyes, it would kill you. <laughs> okay. If there are no other questions, I'm going to take two minutes and just sort of, as Fred mentioned, I'm a, a scout leader. I have been teaching insect study merit badge at each of the last eight national jamborees. I'll be running Insect Study Merit Badge again at this jamboree. It's in West Virginia, mid-July for two weeks. I could use one more staff person, which I am not expecting to get here. I'm just gonna mention anyway, just because I keep trying. Uh, Scouts are a wonderful organization. If you do good work, you do work for the public good and you get paid for it, you're called a civil servant. Yeah. If you do work for the public good and you do it for nothing, you're called a volunteer. If you do work for the public good and they charge you money to do that work, you're called, a, you're called a scouter. You have to pay money to be to do volunteer work. They actually charge $1,200 for me to, to work on staff for the, 10, for the 14 days. I'm gonna have to pay them $1,200 to be on staff. It's ridiculous. But it is also really neat with having thousands of Youth, by the way, it's boys and girls coming around looking at trying to get in six study merit badge or looking at all of the crazy stuff that happens. So it is a fun, neat experience. But I'm trying to find one more staff person. So that's one thing. 
The other is I am the adult advisor for a 4-H club called the Bug Patrol. We've been around for over 30 years now. These are a bunch of kids from the age five to 18. Uh, a bunch of my kids are now have their PhD in entomology. It, these are really, really interesting, semi-strange kids. Uh, <clears throat> our fundraiser for the last 20 some odd years has been selling shirts. Normally on a fundraiser, you're selling a $2 item for $10 to make a profit and get money. We sell the shirts that uh, sell in the museum stores for $25 to $30, and we sell them for $12. Uh, literally much less than half price. Uh, some of the members who've been here before have seen some of the stuff in the past. This stuff is ridiculously cheap. Uh, if you buy the mugs, you know, the fancy mugs that you buy in a, in a museum store, like $16 each, we sell them for six. So it gives you an idea of our oh. prices. If anybody, I'm going to leave a catalog with Fred. If anybody's interested, please sign up. Questions somewhere? Uh, Dr. Terrell? Yes. Uh, I just thought I might make the uh, comment, the uh, slide with you with the uh, uh, large scarabs all over your T-shirt. Yes. I think the really big one, the Whopper, looked very reminiscent of Megasoma Mars. Oh, it is. It is. Okay. Just... Uh, there were two megasoma species there, and those were those were the big ones were megasomas. And the other is Acteon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thought so. Uh, they're there. They're fun, and and they crawl on your arm. You have to let them crawl off. You try and pull them off. You will have twelve bloody spots on your arm. I had many more than twelve because I had fun. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. We want to thank. Right. Any other comments or anything? I'll leave this on if anybody wants to talk. We can hear you, by the way. The speakers are on the roof. So if anybody wants to say something, you can. Um, 